are our King, and it is good to join our voices with the heavenly throngs that know this in fullness, and with all of the future universe that will sing in unison your greatness without compromise, without taint, without stain, with no reservation. Even though we sing these words now as a minority in a dark world, and we sing these words sometimes in our hearts, it feels alone. And yet what a joy it is to gather in this room with these people who love you and to have these words resonate in our hearts. God, we pray that those whom we know in this dark world who don't know you yet would sing these same words before it's too late. That we ask even as we look at the end times this morning and and the direction the world is headed, we, we pray that you would stir in us an eagerness to be your ambassadors, an ambassador of goodness and love and joy in Christ, escape from this world, freedom from slavery to sin, a clean record before the bar of your holiness, all in Christ and only in Christ. And we pray that you'd stay our hearts about the world around us on the rock solid foundation which is you, your purpose, your plan, all centered in your son. We thank you in his name. Amen. You may be seated. We arrived this morning at something of a famous portion of the Bible, at least famous in our culture. We are looking this morning at the false prophet and the mark of the beast. Revelation chapter 13. Saddam Hussein was a bad guy. He was a really bad guy. He was a student of Marx, a student of Hitler, and a student of Stalin. But Saddam Hussein out Stalin Stalin. He took the plays from Stalin's playbook and outdid him. At one point, early in his notorious career, he assembled all of his government into one room and closed the doors. And there appeared at the rostrum a clearly tortured man who confessed, forced confessed, to being opposed to Saddam's regime. Those who have studied the scene suspect that the man's wife, perhaps children, were being held somewhere else and that his phony confession was was used uh, because his family was being harmed. So he confessed and, and wept before the crowd to being opposed to Saddam's regime. And he knew he would be taken out and shot. But before he stepped down, he named a co-conspirator. This was someone who was not involved in any plot. It was just somebody that Saddam Hussein wanted removed. And so this man, in an attempt to perhaps ameliorate the suffering of his own family, named someone else as a conspirator. And soldiers abruptly came into the crowd and took that man out the back door. And another was named, and another, and another. And one by one, individually, these men were taken out the back doors of the room until half the room was gone. The one at a time, escorted by armed soldiers, it was clear they were all going to be shot outside. And Saddam sat silently while the parade happened. Very few, if any of these men, were actual conspirators against the regime. And as people started to see what was happening, men stood up spontaneously and loudly began to shout, Saddam is the greatest, trying to pledge some last minute loyalty to gain favor with the tyrant. And even some of them were hauled away. All of this was a tactic to evoke fear and absolute submission. You see, if the tyrant could take away the guilty, that's one thing. But if he could take away those whom everybody knew was innocent, then everybody would be quiet in fear and submission. And the men in the room knew it was a lie, but to survive the day, they had to go along with it. 
After all the conspirators removed, so-called conspirators, the remaining members were handed revolvers and commanded to do the dirty deed. Out back, they executed their countrymen and friends in cold blood. And now they had blood on their hands and they could be manipulated any way the regime wanted. In the 1950s, most Iraqis were illiterate. And so Saddam started a very benevolent literacy program designed to bring the next generation into the modern world. And the books they used to teach the kiddos how to read were regime propaganda. It taught the kids that Saddam was great. The parents couldn't read what the kids were learning, and they didn't know how they were being indoctrinated in schools. The teachers would ask the children in the classroom, do your parents ever speak negatively about Saddam or the government? It's all right. You can tell me. They just don't know any better. They haven't been to school like you have. And so the kids would tell their teachers. A few days later, dad would disappear for a few weeks and he would return to the home different and silent. Never again would anything negative be said about Saddam at home. And dad had to make a choice to live by the lie or speak the truth and die. That was the brilliance of Saddam, if we can say it that way. He forced several generations of Iraqis to live by lies that they knew were lies. And that is really pernicious. It's one thing to be lied to. But it's another thing entirely, even more sinister, to get people to submit to what they know is a lie. To get the people to lie to themselves and live by it. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote Gulag Archipelago, describes his time in the series of Russian prisons and labor camps under a very similar scenario. And the theme of his very long biography is three simple, four simple words. Live not by lies. He recognized that everybody went along with the lie and then there was no more truth. And the really sad reality was that everyone knew it was a lie and went along with it. What some have experienced at the hands of some bad tyrants through world history will be the whole world's experience in the last days. And we come now to this grave scene in our Bibles. Revelation 13, 11 to 18. Follow along as I read this. John records future history. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he was speaking as a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. And he does great signs. So that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which were given to him to do in the presence of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, the small and the great, the rich, the poor, the free and the slaves, that they be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead, and that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, and his number is 666. This morning we're looking at the second beast, and by way of outline, we'll just look at six marks of the second beast. We begin in verse 11 with his character. Notice how John records this new person on the stage. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and he was speaking as a dragon. Then I saw here the first words mark a new scene and a new character. He is called another beast. That is, he is another of the same kind as the first beast. He is going to be similar 
to the first beast in that he is demonically, satanically empowered. And he's similar to the first beast in that he is an individual and human. It's interesting, he's only called a beast here in this verse. In fact, from this point forward, he has another title. He is referred to as the false prophet. Flip over to chapter 16 and verse 13. He is described there, I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. From this point forward in the book of Revelation, he is no longer called another beast or even the second beast. He is simply called the false prophet. This is the same character. In fact, every time you see the word beast with the article, the beast is a reference to the Antichrist. This one is the Antichrist's assistant. And we'll refer to him going forward as the false prophet. Jesus in Matthew 24, 24 said that there will be false Christs and false prophets. Don't believe them. In the great tribulation, the future period of time that we're examining here in Revelation 13, we will have the false Christ and the false prophet. Notice he is said in verse 11 to come out of the earth. That's a contrast to the first beast who came up out of the sea As we talked about before, I believe that's a reference to the abyss, a reference to the fact that he went into death and came back out again. This second beast, the false prophet, does not experience that kind of a a resurrection event. Uh, He is human, he's an individual, he is a mortal, uh, but he hasn't come back from the dead. He has said in verse 11 that he has two horns like a lamb. This third character of the unholy trinity, Satan, the beast, and the false prophet. This third member is an imitator, just like the others. He is imitating here Jesus. He's a counterfeit. He looks like a little lamb. The portrayal is of meekness and and humility, of a docile creature. And this is perhaps a contrast to the Antichrist, Back in verse 6 of chapter 13, we read that the Antichrist opens his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. It seems the Antichrist is, is given to bombastic boasts. And this one is a contrast to those arrogant blasphemies. It says that he speaks as a dragon in verse 11. That is, he is a lethal low talker. His conversation is dragon talk. It might sound smooth, reasonable, soothing to the world. And as personal assistant to the Antichrist, his job will be to sell the earth dwellers a compelling and deadly deception. We move next to his activity in verse 12. Read along. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. Uh, Literally here, he does the authority of the first beast. And that word for does in the original shows up five times back to back to back relating. This is a very busy man. He is doing a lot of things. He is very active and he gets his authority from the beast who got his authority from Satan or the dragon and all of the passive verbs, it was given to him, it was given to him, it was given to him throughout this section indicate that ultimately all of this is by permission of God. The presence of the unholy trinity and their activity on the earth is in fact a judgment of God against the earth for their rejection of him. And so what does he do according to verse 12? His activity is all about causing the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the Antichrist. So he wins the world over to organized religion. All of a sudden, religion will be popular again. And the reference to Antichrist's miraculous return from the death is there in verse 12. The first beast is the one whose fatal wound was healed. Uh, The way this is written seems to indicate that the wound is still visible. Maybe as a continuing reminder of his death and return from death. And the new world religion will be in awe of the beast, centered around the beast, and the false prophet will lead a unified world in that new religion. We see next in verse 13, his power. The text tells us he does great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth 
in the presence of men. Here, this false prophet is imitating the activities of true prophets. Back in chapter 11, we discovered those two prophets of God who tormented those who dwell on the earth. They were able to call down fire upon earth dwellers. So the false prophet imitates their miracles, sort of like Pharaoh's magicians imitated the miracles that God did through Moses. This is also an imitation of the Elijah, the Old Testament prophet, who in 1 Kings 18 called down fire from heaven to scoop up the sacrifice in his competition against the, the prophets of Baal. Elijah also called down fire in 2 Kings chapter 1 when uh, the king sent soldiers after Elijah in groups of 50. And a group of 50 soldiers would come. Elijah called down fire upon them and consumed them. A second group of 50 soldiers came it consumed them. Third group of soldiers said, hey, wait, can we talk? And this false prophet is calling down fire from heaven. If you could imagine it, it would be dramatic. It would be compelling. It would be convincing. This sign would be believable. This is not pyrotechnics. This is not tricks. Uh, These are real, undeniable, powerful miracles. They will have the effect of convincing the world in the deception. And notice, the text tells us these are done in the presence of men. The end of verse 13. That is, they're very public. Uh, They're on open display. This is an open display of supernatural power. Uh, These are not miracles done somewhere in a studio or off in a dark corner somewhere that that the rumor sort of spreads that somebody has some powers. No, this is for everybody to see. Not rumors, but undeniable power. And we move next to his deceptions. We see this in verse 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth. Because of the signs which were given to him to do in the presence of the beast. Signs and wonders have a powerful effect in the end times. They they promote the deception. And you have to understand how convincing the miracles of the false prophet will be. God warned his people long ago not to be deceived by signs and wonders performed by prophets. But we should rather believe God's word. Listen, there are supernatural forces at work. And and there will be times when God permits demonic forces, satanic forces to exercise wonderful works on the world. Not just sleight of hand, but supernatural things. Listen to Deuteronomy 13. Moses warned, if a prophet or dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, let's go after other gods whom you have not known and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For Yahweh your God is testing you to find out if you love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow Yahweh your God and fear him. And you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him and cling to him. This is the one of the very real dangers of believing with our eyes or believing with our feelings or leaning on experientialism over and against the word of God. What's the final authority? Some impressive miracle? Listen, Pharaoh's magicians can do that. Simon Magus in the book of Acts can do that. Satan, who shields himself, masquerades as an angel of light, can do powerful things. Don't believe those. Believe the word of God. And notice, these were given him to do in verse 14, in the presence of the beast. That is permitted by God. Again, as a judgment to the world that has rejected God's truth. Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians 2 tell us this very thing. He says, the lawless one will be revealed. The one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send the deluding influence so they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but they took pleasure in wickedness. 
God will give them over to the deception and the deception will be convincing. There's a second part of this deception in verse 14. It says, he tells those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. So now there is to be this tangible, physical, visible representation of the Antichrist constructed on the earth. This is reminiscent of that 90 foot tall golden statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up on the plain of Dura in Babylon in Daniel chapter 3. So the command is given and in Daniel's day the music started and then everyone was commanded as soon as the music starts to bow down before the statue. And you know the amazing thing about that kind of worship is it doesn't have to be sincere, it doesn't have to be from the heart, it just has to be mechanical. It just, everybody down, music's down, music starts, everybody's down. And the three guys who didn't bow stood out like a sore thumb. Here in Revelation 13, the monument will not be a tribute to Nebuchadnezzar, but a tribute to the Antichrist, the beast. And again, here in verse 14, we have a reference to his fatal sword wound and his resurrection. And perhaps the image will bear the marks of that wound of the sword from which he had come to life. You know, in the Ten Commandments that God gave to Israel, he gave a very specific commandment about images. He said, you shall make no graven image. Why does God do that? Why does God prohibit pictures of him, sculptures of him, carvings of him? This goes back to the very nature of who God is as the uncreated creator, as holy That is fundamentally different than everything that has been made. He is infinite in his being and he cannot be reduced to some image, something tangible, something finite, something physical, something made up of created things. He is appropriately jealous for his glory and he will not have his infinite uncreated nature represented by finite and created things. So he says, make no graven image. Satan has no such scruples. Satan satisfied if you worship an image, uh, one made to represent himself or his antichrist or any man. Satan is pleased when people worship images made to look like birds and animals and reptiles. Satan is pleased even when we make images of the one true God. He knows that's a slander on God's character. He knows it's prohibitive. It defames God to reduce him to some man-made, physical, visible representation. But the false prophet will cause an image of the beast to be constructed for the world to revere. Again, Satan is happy with any of that. Notice verse 15. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast. And so the false prophet animates the statue, gives it the breath of life, as it were. Now, this is a step up from Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar's statue just sort of stood there, didn't do anything, didn't say anything. It was inanimate. This animation of the beast image constructed on the earth is this technology. Or is this supernatural? What will it that will animate this beast? You're probably already thinking of artificial intelligence and and the unbelievable progress we've made in technology that could make such things possible. It it could be the case that that man's development of technology um, animates something like this. But I believe that the animation of this beast is miraculous in line with the other Pieces of this deception. Supernatural, demonic power. Look at the last half of verse 15. And we discover the prophet's aim. His aim. The image of the beast would even speak. And cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast. To be killed. What is the aim of the false prophet? As he's organizing this new religion. Total conformity. 
total control, absolute uniformity of religion. Again, the, the world kind of gravitates toward this idea of when we'll drop all of our dividing convictions and we'll all just get along and we'll just have one religion all together. Doesn't that sound sweet? This isn't sweet. The image of the beast will be able to talk and to kill. Do you see that in verse 15? He gave breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would speak and the image of the beast would cause to be killed as many as do not worship the image. My, my mind tries to picture this. We have movies and novels, I think War of the Worlds and Avengers type things where you just have zapping people all over the world who aren't conforming to worship. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, three guys standing up in the plain of Dura, tossed into a fiery furnace. You won't bow the knee to the image of the beast. You get killed. But who does the killing in Revelation 13? It is the image. The image is empowered to speak, to articulate, and then to exterminate. And so the aim of all of this is that the whole world will worship the beast or face the consequences. This is quite a few steps up from Nebuchadnezzar's statue in Daniel 3. The speaking and killing will be very real. Uh, This is not sleight of hand, not some illusion. Those who resist will very literally be murdered by the image of the beast for non-compliance to the one world religion. This will be a terrifyingly dark day in human history. And this is the aim of the false prophet. Like the proper goal of any prophet of any religion, his his job description is to convince the people to follow the leader. And he will do that. We see his strategy for it, finally, in verses 16 through 18, through the end of the chapter. Look at verse 16. And he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free and the slave, that they be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead, so that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. In military strategy, strategists have described a pincher movement. And a a pincher movement is, is the idea where you send a divided force to surround the enemy in two great arms and then squeeze them from both sides. The pincher movement has been effective in various field battles throughout world history. You divide your striking force, surround and squeeze. You put the enemy in in your vice. And the false prophet strategy is something like a pincher movement. On the one hand, he wows the crowds with miracles. And on the other hand, he forces their submission by threat of death. And in one sense, he's unifying the world and world religion by saying, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. And the easy way is just be impressed and get along with the program. Uh, Gullibility. And the hard way is an appeal to humanity's survival instinct. You want to live? You want to do commerce? You want to be able to go to the supermarket? You want to buy and sell? You want to eat? You want to feed your family? Uh, Then we're going to enforce your ability to do that. You will not be able to buy and sell unless you take this mark. His strategy of enforcement is what's called here a mark uh, given on the right hand or the forehead. This is designed to visibly indicate that you have pledged loyalty to the beast. The mark, this, this word for mark was used exclusively of the emperor in John's day, was tied to worship of the emperor And at some times was used as a threshold for whether you could buy or sell. So this this is not a a new feature in world history. It just happens to be global in the end times. I want you to see some important features of the mark of the beast in these three verses. First of all, notice that it is a universal requirement. Verse 16, he causes all. Small, great, rich, poor. No class is excluded. This is for everybody. 
Everybody has to get the mark of the beast. Now, this universal requirement has some who abstain. There are some who abstain. Look across the page at chapter 14 and verse 9. Another angel, a third one, followed, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand. And the key word there is if. And the implication is there will be some who don't. And then look down at verse 11. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. The those and the whoever again indicate that there are some who don't. So not everybody will take the mark. And the mark is to be highly visible. We need to notice this from the text as well. It is to be on the right hand or the forehead. The right hand and the forehead are very prominent, visible locations. It's public proof. It's not a secret tattoo somewhere, but it is visible. Maybe the first thing you would see of someone as you saw their face. Uh, The right hand extended either in handshakes or in forms of payment would be readily visible. And this readily visible mark would be public proof that you gave your loyalty to the Antichrist and to Satan behind him. What is the significance of this visible public mark? Well, first of all, you haven't taken it yet. We checked you on the way in this morning. The, the security guys at the front were just, they were looking at foreheads and right hands. They were making sure that, that you didn't have it. No, you, you don't have the mark of the beast. Uh, it, it is a mark on the forehead and the right hand. It, it's not in a vaccine. It's not embedded in your credit card. You have not sold your soul to the devil unbeknownst to yourself simply by signing, signing up for Amazon Prime or the Disney Channel. I just hope that's comforting to you that you haven't taken the mark of the beast unbeknownst to yourself. The other significance of this detail is that immediately everyone becomes a snitch. There's somebody who doesn't have this on their right hand. There's somebody who doesn't have it on their forehead. It becomes obvious. See something, say something, takes on a more sinister tale then. If you see someone without a mark, tell the authorities. Listen, if you thought mask shaming during COVID-19 was bad, mark of the beast shaming during the great tribulation will be deadly. This was the strategy that Saddam Hussein utilized in Iraq. He didn't need a mass of stormtroopers or the KGB to enforce loyalty. He used the populace as informants. Everybody knew as they cowered in fear that if they did not report somebody who was hostile to the regime, they themselves would be taken out and shot. Kids would inform on their parents. Neighbors would squeal on each other. And that culture of fear darkened the entire country. That culture of fear will darken the whole world. Another detail about this mark of the beast is it represents ownership. It is a branding of belonging. Belonging to the beast. The beast in his dark humor and Satan with his evil intent have just stamped humanity saying, you are mine. It is wicked. In John's day, a brand, a tattoo was placed on slaves and soldiers to indicate who owned them. And then pagan worshipers who were loyal to a a certain deity in a certain shrine, a certain temple, would get a tattoo to inform the world that they belonged to that deity. We also see in this verse, verse 17, That it becomes a license for trade. Becomes a license for trade. No one is able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark. This is a stiff enforcement. If you want to eat, 
If you want to survive, get the mark. If you want to feed your families, if you want to operate in the realm of commerce, you must have the mark. In John's own day, the Roman emperor Domitian did something like this for those who lived in the Roman province of Asia. The image had either the face or the name of the emperor on a stamp, a coin, or a seal. And you had to be able to present that image stamped on some token that you had proven your loyalty to the emperor in order to buy and sell in the marketplace. And we covered this when we went through the letters to the seven churches. The trade guilds in Asia did the same things. It was like being part of a labor union. Uh, the local teamsters said the, the, the patron deity of the teamsters is so-and-so, and you have to go get a certif- certificate that you worshipped at that deity's altar in order to be a welder with our group. You're not allowed to work with us. You're not allowed to sell your goods in this city unless you had proven your loyalty to the patron deity. And this put Christians out of sorts. The the Christians in those seven churches in chapters 2 and 3 were originally considered a a subset of Judaism. Uh, They worshipped Judaism's Messiah. They read Judaism's book, the Old Testament. But once the Jews didn't want to be affiliated with Christians anymore, they said, they're not Jews. And the Christians didn't get to survive under the protections that Rome gave to Judaism. They were considered atheists and a sect. And then they were liable to persecution. Uh, They couldn't buy and sell. They couldn't work in the trade guilds. And so they had a choice. Pay your dues, worship the patron deity, get a receipt, and go about your business. Live or maintain your integrity. Don't live by the lie. And you have to trust the Lord for provision. During the great tribulation, this mark will be physically placed on the right hand or the forehead. And this worldwide stipulation will be a severe trial. Every human alive will have to decide for himself. Do I give in and survive or resist and be killed? Or resist and be on the run and risk starvation. We also notice that this mark of the beast is tied to worship. It is a declaration of religious loyalty. Look at chapter 16 and verse 2. We'll get to the final bull judgments of God then. In the first one, the angel poured out his bowl on the earth and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who have the mark of the beast and who worship his image. You see there, the the mark of the beast and worshiping the image are tied together. and, And that is the same throughout the rest of the instances of the description of the mark of the beast. The final one comes in chapter 20 and verse 4. John says, I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their witness of Jesus and because of the word of God, who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead on their hand. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Those are the tribulation martyrs who did not take the mark of the beast, did not worship the image of the beast. See, those two things are tied together. The corollary to that is that all those who did take the mark did worship the beast and are therefore headed to the lake of fire. And the other thing we notice about this mark of the beast is it is imitation. Just as Satan and the beast and the false prophet are an imitation trinity, they imitate the characteristics of Jesus, the counterfeit miracles all of these things, this, even this seal is a, a mocking imitation of what God does. In chapter 7 and in chapter 14, we see that God seals his saints and writes his name on their forehead. And here the, the false prophet is saying, well, we're going to write the Antichrist's name on foreheads of humanity. And, and, and this is such a, such a tragic and ugly mockery. It is a dark mockery of humanity. Mankind was created in the image of God. And that word image is the, is the word for impress. Kind of like a, a stamp, something like a mark. 
that mankind was created in the image of God, but in the last days, Satan will put his own mark on humanity. And Satan's message over a corrupted humanity is simply this, I'm Lord, I tell you where to go, I tell you what to do, I tell you when you can eat, and then I'll kill you when you're done serving your purposes. Whoever's left at the end then goes with Satan to judgment. This is a a wicked, dark, satanic parody of God's seal of love for his people. He is an imitator, but the imitation is awful. And the last thing we see about this mark of the beast is it is the beast's name. Look at the end of verse 17. The mark is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This mark of the beast is is simply his name or a number that represents it. Notice verse 18. He says, here is wisdom. And, And this wisdom here is skill in discerning the identity of the Antichrist. There is a skill that must be exercised to discern his identity. And then notice the next phrase in verse 18. Let him who has understanding calculate the number. The one who has understanding must is a command. It's a way to say there's somebody who must do something. The one who has this wisdom, the one who has this understanding, John tells us, must calculate the number of the beast. That is, to give a numerical reckoning, to solve a math problem, is what that phrase means. And he goes on to say, it is the number of a man. What is this all about? Um, the, the, num- the mark of the beast is, is a number of the beast that must be calculated. And, and that's explained as it's the number of a man. And the number is 666. This idea of a name being a number tied to a person was understood in John's day. In ancient languages, letters could represent numerical values. The first nine letters of the Greek alphabet had the number values of one through nine. The second set of nine letters represented 10, 20, 30, all the way through 90. And a third set, and they had to add some letters to do it, represented 100, 200, 300. Now, the Hebrew language is similar. They do the same kinds of things with numerical values for letters. The technical word for, for this Interpreting letters through numbers is called gematria. Uh, It's practiced in many ancient languages. Latin has a form of this. English has a form of this. This would have been known in John's day. In fact, there's graffiti in the first century that actually says this about the emperor Nero, who, who, by the way, was famous for having murdered his mom. There was graffiti on a wall that says this, quote, Count the numerical value in Nero's name and, in the phrase, murdered his own mother, and you will find their sum is the same. So, kind of a clever way to play with the letters in a name, add up the total numbers, and sort of see what happens. What are, what's being encouraged here? Here's Wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and the number is 666. Just means that saints in the great tribulation are required by God to exercise insight, just as Daniel the prophet said they would. They are given this verse in this chapter so that they can exercise the wisdom that God commands of them. They will have what they need to do the math problem. They will calculate the number of the name. They can identify the Antichrist. They will see through the deception. They will refuse the mark of the beast. Why will they be able to do all of this? Fundamentally, because they will have their names already written in the Lamb's book of life. There's a temptation for us, I think. A temptation that has been prevalent throughout church history. I want to identify the Antichrist. I want to do the math problem. I want to figure this out. Maybe your temptation is, I want it to be the end times, therefore I want to discover who the Antichrist is. Or maybe there's a temptation to sell books. 
Trust me, you do not want us to be in the great tribulation right now. We're not in it, and you don't want us to be in it. And so, we won't know who he is. The only time that 666 will make sense as the number of the name of a man who is to be identified as the Antichrist by those who follow Jesus and have wisdom in that time. The only time that's possible historically is during the Great Tribulation. Irenaeus was an early church father. He died about 200 AD. By the way, if you go to the first three centuries of church history, their view of the end times was the same as ours. That, that kind of got muddled over the years. But Irenaeus warned against speculating about who it is. He affirmed the Antichrist is a man. He will have this name, which is a number. But he said, wait until the fulfillment and it will be obvious to those who follow God. When Antichrist is in power, his name will be known and the number of his name will be 666. If only we had followed Irenaeus's warning for the last 1800 years, then we wouldn't have lists of hundreds of names of candidates for the Antichrist. The reformers identified basically every Pope by name as the Antichrist. Post-Reformation history did the same thing. Uh, Ex-wives probably don't qualify for a number of reasons. Many have gotten on gematria calculators. You'll probably do this this afternoon, even if I encourage you not to. <clears throat> Where you can type in words and phrases and names and see the various ways those things add up to numbers. Of course, everybody's looking for the magic number. And maybe against better judgment, I applied this to my own name just to see what would happen. And, and there are several ways to go about this. You can do this in Hebrew. You can turn English letters into Hebrew letters and get their numerical value. You can do a simple gematria where A equals 1, B equals 2, C equals 3. Or you can do the version of this that was practiced in Old English when English only had 24 letters in the medieval period and A equaled 6, B equaled 12, C equaled 18, and on and on and on. So I chose the Old English gematria calculator and I typed in Andrew Yates. 810. <laughs> Andrew Edward Yates, 1140. Andy Yates, 684. <laughs> Andy E. Yates, 714. Smedley Yates, 888. <laughs> Andrew Smedley Yates, 1278. And then I typed in Smed Yates. I kid you not. Six, six, six. <laughs> Is that disqualifying? <laughs> and then if you sort of reverse it, you, you search by the number 666, you come up with 286 pages, each with dozens and dozens of entries of names turned into Hebrew letters, and 424 pages of entries in English. Um, one of those, for instance, is a DNA storage blockchain biochip equals 666. Since you're curious, <laughs> Andrew Tate, vaccination, New York, computer, Mark of Beast, Image of Satan, a COVID vaccine, <laughs> Santa Claus, <laughs> forehead sign, people sin, an absence of God. Sometimes you have to like re-spell some of these words and names. Ebola vaccines, new age begins, a whole bunch of people's names that somebody didn't like. We don't know who it is. The, the task of the church now is to preach the gospel and not figure out who the Antichrist is. What's coming will be the new world order, the global government, the one world religion. But let me give you some not takeaways. Usually towards the end of a sermon, we start thinking about, okay, how do I apply this to my life? Can I just start with some how to not to apply this to your life? 
First of all, don't fear that you've taken the mark of the beast. I'm serious. You, you haven't. The mark of the beast is the final Faustian bargain. The world will make a deal with the devil and forfeit their eternal souls. It's not possible now. It's not on the scene. It hasn't happened. You haven't taken it. However, have you put yourself in league with the world? Have you been making Faustian bargains in your own life? Are there ways in which you're willing to live by lies so that you can get along? Shortcuts, compromises, integrity shortcomings, moral shortcomings, in order to flow with the crowd, to, to not stick out, to, to not be like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in some fiery furnace just because you wouldn't go through the motions of doing what everybody else is doing. Listen, in, in the end times, the mark of the beast will not be something you can stumble into accidentally or something you can say, cross my fingers behind my back, I really love Jesus, but go ahead. It will be a public, committed betrayal of Christ leading to the lake of fire and affiliation with the worship of Satan and the unholy trinity. And we're not there yet. But even today, are there ways in which we are affiliating ourselves with the world, comfortable with the world, in league with the, the lies that Satan puts out even in our own day just to get along? Pragmatism, convenience, make life a little easier. Listen, we, we don't want to have to stand out if we don't want to. Why, why say something obnoxious that the world hates? Well, if, if what the word of God says is obnoxious to the world, then, then we must say it. Now, there are plenty in our day who name the name of Christ and yet short the testimony of the word of God in the world where it is offensive. This has been prevalent in missions in Muslim contexts where people who had a, a well-meaning desire to make Jesus known among Muslims cut out the doctrine and the theology that were particularly offensive to Muslims, like the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, like Yahweh as the divine name, or substitutionary atonement and bodily resurrection. Those things are all offensive. So can't we just go into Muslim culture, sort of be insiders, and sneak Jesus in? I think that's a holding hands with the world and a Faustian bargain that actually undermines the gospel and missions. There are many other things that the world is doing and modern evangelicalism is selling out to the world for approval. Maybe with the, the, the well-meaning desire that if the world likes us, they'll listen to what we have to say. What's the problem with that? The world doesn't like the message. So, Shaving down the message so as to be liked actually removes the message the world needs to hear. And it is doing something similar as the mindset of taking the mark of the beast. Here's another not takeaway. Um, don't try to figure out who's the beast. I think we covered that one. It's not me. <laughs> it's not you. Whoever's name you might spell out to 666, it's not them either. Here's another not takeaway. Prep, ammo, and food stores. At least not from Revelation 13. You, you can't prep for the great tribulation. You, you can't ward off the, the danger that's coming. And if you're in the Lord Jesus Christ and part of his church today, you won't be there. Maybe you need to prep things for natural disasters and political turmoil, but, but not on the basis of Revelation 13 and the Great Tribulation. You're not prepping for the end times. And let me give you, give you one more not takeaway. Don't try to stop this from happening. That's not our task. Hey, I, I read Revelation 13. It's all going to one world government. So I'm going to make it my mission in life to stop the one world government. 
It's all moving toward one religion. I'm going to stop the one world religion. These things are coming because God wants them to happen. These things are coming because this is what the Lord of the universe is giving to a rebellious world. You're not stopping that train. You're not impeding it by knowing how it ends and then somehow changing it. We really don't want to change the end of this story. We don't meddle here in God's plans. That is not the goal of the Christian. Nowhere are we given these future lookings into history in order to make them stop. They're in our Bibles for other reasons. So let me give you a couple of takeaways. Live not by lies. To borrow Solzhenitsyn's words. He was talking about communism. But the reality, Christian, is when you and I, out of a pragmatic approach to survival, go along with the lie. Don't think you've sacrificed just on some little thing that doesn't matter in the end. I'm just going to be about the gospel. I don't really care about what the world says about transgenderism. That's not the main issue. I don't really care what the world says about this vice or that vice. The reality is, the battleground is wherever the world crosses the word of God. The world has drawn battle lines, probably not in places we would pick. Listen, we would all love, maybe you would, I don't know. I don't want to put words in your mouth. But I think we'd all sort of love the idea anyway of going down for the gospel. You know, boldly preaching Christ and, and being shot while doing it or something along those lines. Satan's more conniving than that. We, we would love for it to be that noble. And, and, and some go down that way. But if you think about the English reformers in the 1550s, what did they go down for? They went down for the theological difference between transubstantiation and a right view of the Lord's table. We're, we're talking about a, a, a church fight over how to think about communion. But they knew the gospel was at stake in it. They knew they were going down for ultimate things. They were willing to be burned at the stake over that issue. But what did the press say? Oh, these guys are trifling with stuff that doesn't even matter. And the tragedy of the English church is a couple hundred years later, they went back on the very things those English reformers fought for. Totally caved. Out of convenience, out of politics. So live not by lies. When the world lies, when Satan behind the world brings lies, and Christians say, it just doesn't matter that much. We become victims the way the Iraqi people became victims of Saddam. Not only have we bought into a lie, but we bought into what we know is a lie and went along with it for expedience. That's doubly tragic. It parallels the insanity of the human heart that knows that God exists, Romans 1.18, so that they're without excuse, but suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That is the fundamental insanity of the human heart without Christ. I know God exists, but I'm going to come up with every other excuse to explain him away so I don't have to answer to him, so I can live how I want to live. It is in the end an untenable worldview. There are no real atheists in the world. There are those who suppress the truth and call themselves atheists. Don't live by lies. Another takeaway is just to have discernment, fortitude, and faith. Be familiar with the word of God. Take the word of God in week after week, day after day. Have your mind renewed by the word of God. So that you can see through the counterfeits. So that you can see through the deceptions. So that you can live for God with integrity. And then there is an old doctrine for the Christian life. We don't talk about much anymore. It is called the doctrine of separation. It is the doctrine of being separate from the world. Separate from the world in its motives and its worldview and its thinking. Do not love the world, John says. 
We've sort of lost that. And, and I grant the tension is hard. We're tempted either to retreat from the world or to totally imbibe the world. Both of those are wrong. Early church history tried the retreat thing. They did the monasteries out in the wilderness. What's the problem with a monastic movement? Well, the light of the gospel just left the target audience. And by the way, whatever problems you thought you were escaping by going to a monastery, you took with you in your own heart to the monastery. How did Jesus describe his disciples? They were to be in the world. Don't take them out of it, but not of the world. This isn't our home. This is not our citizenship. These are not our loyalties, but this is our mission field. We walk out of this room this morning by architectural design. You were to walk out of this hall, see the, the Bible in your own language, walk past that map with the continents of the world portrayed on it. And remember, as you go out those doors, there's people beyond these doors who don't have God's word in their language. There's people beyond these doors that don't hear God's word proclaimed. There are people in all my walks of life who don't yet know Christ. And they are headed to hell in a handbasket. That handbasket is this world. It is inevitably going toward the Antichrist and his lies and a one world government and the judgment of God. And the people around us need to be rescued. We can't retreat. But at the same time, we must separate in the biblical ways that God demands. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this sobering chapter. We know this is not fiction or fairy tale because these are your words. And while it portrays a, a dark history that it's, it may be difficult for us to get our own imaginations around, we know that those throughout history who have faced such things on a smaller scale can attest to the weakness of the human heart, the compelling and convincing lies of evil tyrants, and the murderer of humanity behind it all. We thank you that we who are in you are protected from the ultimate outcomes of these things. We are in fact overcomers by faith in you, Lord Jesus, who overcame by your own blood. And we thank you that by grace we can belong to you. In your name. Amen.